Hello there and welcome back to MGT4520. My name is Dr. Matthew Pauly. I am going to guide you today on globalization and international entrepreneurship. So let's go. So let's look at globalization in the international environment. And today, what we're aiming to do is understand the implications of taking a venture globally, define the critical issues of taking a company globally, identify and define strategic issues faced by global entrepreneurs, determine methods for analyzing the environment in which a venture is operating, and determine the key components of planning and taking a venture global. Going global, where success depends on your ability to identify and leverage core competencies. When it comes to strategic effects of going global, some of the challenges that you're really going to run into uh, domestic and international regulations. Part of this is commercial invoicing, bills of landing, inspection certificates, shippers, export declarations, tariffs. For those of you who shop on eBay or other commercial sites where you're buying things from abroad and they're being brought into the United Kingdom, quite often we're familiar with tariffs, extra taxes or things or import duties that we have to pay for bringing those resources, for bringing those materials from abroad into the country. Another part of it is proximity to customers and new distribution systems, as well as physical and psychological closeness to the market. Now, these again are challenges to strategic effects of going global. Now let's dive in a little bit deeper and look at psychological distance issues. And there's three components to psychological distance issues. The first being distance envisioned. Now this can be based on perception versus reality, such as Canada, Australia with the United States and where you're missing important differences in these areas. So although all three of these countries speak English, all three of them have very different cultures, have very different uh, starting points, really. And so although we can perceive them as being similar, as being English Commonwealth or being you know, connected to Britain some way, somehow, they have evolved, they have grown, they are very different countries. The second component is closer psychological proximity can help entry. So those that are more familiar with the countries you're trying to enter have a greater chance, a greater likelihood of being able to enter those marketplaces. For example, if I wanted to enter the Chinese market right now, I know nothing about Mandarin or Cantonese. I do have a few friends that are from China. I do have a few friends that speak those languages. So although myself, I, I'm not really familiar with it, I do have friends that might be able to bridge that gap and bring me closer to an understanding of possibly starting a company in China. But again, number two, closer psychological proximity can really help people enter, really help businesses enter foreign markets. And the third part being entrepreneurs have some similarities than, sorry, have more similarities than differences regardless of the country. So the act of you know taking on risk, the act of starting a business, the act of looking at the marketplace, opportunities, risks, challenges, adaptability, copability, entrepreneurs, regardless of the culture of the country that you are coming from, are very similar. Now, other things that you should really think about are trade agreements and how they can help and hurt your company, such as Brexit, you have now the USMCA, which used to be the NAFTA agreement, North American Free Trade Agreement, Free Trade Trade Agreement, and European Union. Outsourcing need to manage trade agreements effectively to reduce costs. So psychological proximity for those who do not know what that means, psychological psychological proximity is the perceived closeness or proximity that people feel to an object another person an event or an issue now that we understand a little bit more on the psychological positioning of an individual and and whether or not they can enter other markets or whether or not they want to enter other markets this brings us to strategic issues which can include the allocation of responsibilities between stateside and foreign operations, international operations, such as planning, reporting, and control systems for that 
expansion into the other country, proper organizational structure for international operations, potential degree of standardization. Is the domestic country you're operating in similar to the international country you're looking to develop, you're looking to expand into? Is there any degree or is there a potential degree for standardization? Now, each of these issues affects, with an A, affects the firm's organizational structure in three primary stages. The first being the entrepreneur adopts centralized decision-making. So this lacks international know-how. The second being success leads to decentralized decisions, meaning it's too complex of a system now, so we need local shops in the areas. Or the third, more success leads to conflict between country operations. And this can be drawn from communication faults or headquarters take responsibility back for corporate strategy delivery, especially as it pertains to planning, reporting, and control systems that are integral for success. So now that we've looked at a bit of micro level aspects of psychological positioning and where and how the entrepreneur might look at situations when it comes to internationalization and international entrepreneurship, let's look at more macro level economic market topics such as the World Trade Organization. Now the World Trade Organization was established in 1995 to liberalize international trade by eliminating slash reducing trade tariffs, subsidies, and import quotas. Now, member countries can bring forward disputes through the Dispute Settlement Board. More information on the World Trade Organization can be found in your textbook from pages 20 to 22. With the World Trade Organization, again, it's important to recognize its role in the economic marketplace, especially as it pertains to funding for emerging market nations, whereas the International Monetary Fund is used for all nations. So again, the World Trade Organization is often funded by the wealthiest nations, those that are in the G7, and its primary use is for emerging market nations that need some more support to try and build their economies. As it pertains to trade organizations and small business, the things that we're looking at here are really increasing protectionist attitudes, bilateral country agreements, trade blocks and free trade areas. And the importance of this is to increase trade and agreements between countries. So build each other's economies. You can also trade raw resources. You can, uh, you can trade manufactured resources, right? The European Union, for example, is a su supra nationality. So you cannot enter into trade agreements that are inconsistent with EU regulations, meaning that the EU makes decisions as wholes versus Brexit, who makes, an ind who makes individual decisions based on what's best for the United Kingdom. Both North and South America do have in agreements in place. So let's look at the entrepreneur strategy and trade barriers. And from a macro level of analysis, when we're looking at the marketplace as a whole, trade barriers often increase costs of exporting. They can also cause competitive disadvantages. And a question we really, really need to ask ourselves is, does it become more cost effective to actually manufacture in the native country? An example of this might be tariffs against steel. Right? If we're manufacturing different goods, if we're ma manufacturing materials for building, is it still cheaper to manufacture domestically or should we start to look at other nations or should we start to look internationally at areas of the world that might be cheaper to actually manufacture these goods. Now, another funny example of that is if I asked you where, where does most of the world's cotton come from? And if you really dive deep into it, you'll see that the majority of cotton or at least a large part of cotton in the world comes from Texas. And so Farmers in Texas or, or companies in Texas, for example, will take that raw cotton and send it abroad, send it to India, send it to Bangladesh, send it to China, send it to emerging nations where it is significantly cheaper to use that raw 
material, that raw resource, and manufacture it into clothing, manufacture it into textiles, manufacture it into material that can be used either in households, for people, for companies. But it's still cheaper to send that cotton on the other side of, to the other side of the world and make something out of it. And sadly, the, the consequence of this action, the consequence that we really need to think of from a social and environmental perspective is, you know, what is that impact? What is the cost of, you know, using marine fuel, marine diesel, to send this cotton to India, for example, from the United States? And what is the impact it's having on the environment? Something else to think about is it may have to produce or manufacture in a country that satisfies the local product content regulations of that country. So as you expand, if you move operations from domestic manufacturing to international manufacturing, one of the key things you're going to have to think about are what are the rules and regulations for manufacturing in that country? This is incredibly important when it comes to safety regulations. You'll also have human resource management regulations or human resource regulations. These are considerable things to think about when you're looking at manufacturing domestically versus moving operations abroad. This leads us to what other important considerations are there when we're looking at moving internationally, when we're looking at moving globally. And really, we, we, we need the inner workings of that country. How do they behave? What's the culture? What's the economy like? Is the, the economy growing, shrinking, etc.? And a simple way of looking at this is a macro level of analysis. And, and one of the ways, one of the methods to do this is pestle analysis that we've done countless times. Now, I'm not saying that this is the best way to do it. I'm not even saying that, you know, this is the only way of doing it because there are so many ways to look at the macro environment. But this will give you a brief and quick understanding of the political, environmental, social, technological, environmental, and legal components of a global economy. Your primary agenda here as an entrepreneur that's prospectively moving globally is to pre protect yourself from possible things that could hurt not only your business financially, but you yourself emotionally. You want to look at the country as a whole. You want to look at the market as a whole. You want to look at the economy as a whole, not only the inner workings, the micro level, the people within, but you want to look at how it operates, how it functions at a macro level. And for more examples on this, you can go to pages 22 to 24 in your textbook. Now, some of the requirements of effective planning include situational analysis. And on the right side here, we see table 2.1 that is taken from your textbook. And situational analysis, what are we doing here? We're looking at what are the unique characteristics of each national market? What characteristics does each market have in common with other national markets? So we're trying to gain an understanding of how markets are functioning globally. Is there a common denominator when it comes to operating in, say, Asia, in Europe, North America, South America, Australasia, right? Cluster the markets to increase your ability to understand how to operate in these environments. And other questions you really need to ask yourself is, can any national market be clustered together for operating or planning purposes? Can we just put them all together? Can, can, do they, do they all fit? Do they all match? I don't know. You t can Peru fit with Japan, which can fit with Uruguay, which can fit with Kenya, Sudan. Lastly, what dimensions of the market should you be clustering? And as we see in Table 2.1, requirements of effective planning, reporting, and control in international operations, we've divided the content into four primary sections, which is situational analysis, strategic planning, organizational structure, and controlling the program, each of which are very important when it comes to gaining a greater understanding of 
the marketplace. Moving on to the second component in this table, looking at strategic planning, really what we're trying to do is define the market. We're trying to identify the cluster you want to target and really understand why do they need your product? Why do customers, why would they wanna buy your product? Does it fit in that area? If it does, continue further. If it does not, again, you might wanna ask why, why does it not? Can things be adapted? Can things be adjusted? But if it's a flat out no, then we need to start looking at different markets again. Organizational structure is used to achieve objectives. What objectives do you want to, why are you doing it? What's the purpose, right? What are you trying to accomplish? What are the goals? What are the short-term goals? What are the long-term goals? What are we trying to get to? Operational planning, such as marketing, manufacturing, and distribution. And lastly, controlling the program. So how are you going to measure whether or not this is successful? How are you going to measure whether or not you're performing well coinciding with that so going along with that what are the key development steps what are the key milestones and something else that can help you with this process is actually visually depicting or or writing out or drawing out a gantt chart now a gantt chart is a way to establish not only the timeline whether it be weeks months years but it'll give you a visual representation of the key components, so the key development steps that you need to accomplish if, you, if you're planning on expanding globally. Now it doesn't, with a Gantt chart, you can use a Gantt chart for any project management, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be international business. It doesn't necessarily have to be starting a business internationally. You can use a Gantt chart for just about any project management task. But again, if you are a visually oriented learner, if you're a visually oriented person, developing a Gantt chart, highlighting the key steps and how you're going to measure this performance can be very valuable to you and your company. Now, if we really expand on controlling the program, there's six other elements to it. First being identify markets and cluster countries. Just as we target or, or we look at different customers that we want to sell to, so, so target market demographics, when we're looking at markets and clusters in the countries, what's their size, growth rate, development stage, product life cycle? How do consumers behave? Is there social and cultural factors we need to be aware of? What's the physical environment like? The second component is marketing institutions. So distribution systems, how can you get the information out there? What communication media is available? Are there marketing services? And if there are, how are they used? The third component is industry conditions such as competitive size, practices, technical development of the product or service, followed by legal environment, critical resources, such as personal available skills needed and required. Again, we break resources often down into social resources, human resources, and financial resources. So social resources, we can, we can take it even further and we can delineate it or separate it into weak networks and strong networks and think of weak and strong as related to our emotional attachment or our, our emotional connection with those people. So if it's a strong emotional connection, typically those are friends, family, those that are closest to us. Now, strong networks are very good at providing emotional support. Not exactly the best to discuss business opportunities, business ideas with. Now, that's not, that's not a, a, you know, a be all rule. Some people will be very intelligent when it comes to, you know, business expansion, et cetera. But in general, those that have a strong emotional attachment to us are far often better there for emotional support. Whereas weak networks are those that do not have strong emotional attachments to us. Therefore, there's no pressure on them to satisfy us with specific answers. And so if we look at other global entrepreneurs, if we look in our other entrepreneurial network, our other our business network, 
quite often you'll find that these individuals will be honest and truthful with you about different opportunities you are trying to pursue. Human resources is very much the people you are going to hire, and you'll need to determine whether or not you're going to bring people from your domestic country and integrate them in the international location, or are you going to hire employees from the international location that are aware of the local language, the local customs, the local cultures. And then lastly is the financial resources, which is, you know, where's the money coming from? How are you affording to expand this company globally? Now, political environment, which is the last component of controlling the program, political environment is very much, you know, present and future outlook of the government, especially in emerging economies. Is it a stable government? Is there fluctuation in that government? Is there political instability? Is it hostile? Right? Is it accepting? Is it warming, etc.? Even if it is a hostile area, even if it is a hostile network, it doesn't mean that, you know, never go into those areas. There could be a lot of opportunity to go in those areas, but you have to be very, very understanding, very clear and very aware of how you're exactly going to enter those markets because of that instability. There's going to be that much more risk and danger. So these are the, the, the six components to be aware of when you're looking at controlling the program. So identify markets and clusters and, and cluster the countries, marketing institutions, industry conditions, legal environment, critical resources, and political environment. Thanks for joining us today and following along. That's what we have for the second session today. I hope to see you in the third session. Take care. Have fun.